the reason we started doing this is because we're concerned about this one river, and which is known to be polluted with mercury, the Shenandoah, and, and the local effects, and whether there are local effects that need to be cleaned up and taken care of now. But what we discovered was that this problem of the mercury leaving the river and going into the forest is something that could be happening all over the world, where there's mercury in rivers, which people have thought was just something that the fish had to worry about, and not something that the people and the birds living around the river had to worry about. Now we've shown that there's a way that this mercury can get out, and it does seem to be getting out, and so now we have a problem anywhere there's mercury pollution, and that's thousands of rivers and lakes just in, in the United States, and perhaps tens of thousands around the world. The focus in all past research has been on fish eating birds, because it's so obvious if a fish is contaminated and you eat it, you're going to have high levels of mercury. Scientists had enough on their hands just worrying about fish-eating birds like bald eagles and ospreys and blue herons. And so when we found it in these other birds, we thought, well, they eat lower on the food chain and they don't eat out of the river. How could they be getting it? So while we weren't so surprised, because we did think to look at the spiders right away, each spider is like a little predator that is eating something that has eaten something that has eaten something that ate mercury. So you have a long food chain in which the mercury can biomagnify and become more concentrated. And so a little teeny spider is sort of like, everyone knows there's high levels of contaminants in sharks and killer whales because they're at the top of the food chain. But spiders are also at the top of a food chain. It's just a little Same. tiny food chain. <laughs> when something like mercury, which accumulates in tissues of living organisms, gets into the environment, it biomagnifies. And what that means is that at the, the first organism to eat that mercury has it at a very low level. It's a small organism. It's not sick, it doesn't have a high level of mercury. But a bigger organism eats a whole bunch of those little ones, and it keeps all the mercury from all the little ones. Now that organism, let's say it's a little water flea, that gets eaten by a small fish. That small fish has to eat 100 water fleas to stay alive, so he gets all the mercury from 100 water fleas and he goes into one fish. Now that fish still is healthy, but it's got a higher level of mercury than the bacteria or the water flea. Now a bigger fish eats him and 100 of his friends and has an even higher level of mercury. And now you eat that big fish, you're getting a highly concentrated mercury from that started out in thousands of different bacteria, each of which was at a low level. Uh, there's two ways that mercury really gets into the environment. One is what we call legacy mercury. This is from old gold mines, old factories, such as the one in the Shenandoah River, which have stopped using mercury, but put so much out that it will essentially be there forever. It's an element, and so you can't really just break it down. It doesn't have anywhere to go. The ongoing problem is that every time fossil fuels, mainly coal, are burned, mercury is released into the atmosphere. Uh, while these legacy problems are the most shocking, where you have these incredibly high levels around old mines and things like that, the ongoing problem of mercury from coal is, is the future issue that we need to deal with. We've made a lot of progress on figuring out how it gets into the spiders. There's two main ways. One is that the spiders might spend their whole life in the forest and that mercury is biomagnifying up through the forest food chain. So it gets into the soil, gets into the plants, gets into the grasshopper, spider eats a grasshopper, bigger spider eats the spider, and you get a very concentrated mercury in a spider. That's the terrestrial hypothesis, so it's just moving up the food chain of the land. But the other idea is that every year, mercury from the river concentrates into the bodies of mayflies and dragonflies and midges, all of which spend their early life in the river collecting mercury and then fly out of the river as adults and end up in the forest somewhere. And that idea would mean that if you clean up the river, you're going to clean up the forest because you would no longer have this mercury exported every year to, the, to be eaten by the spiders. But the other idea that it's already in the floodplain and cleaning up the river won't do a thing to what's already in the floodplain, that would mean that the strategy you took to clean up the river would be very different. People who are raising their cows by the river have to worry about it. People who are growing crops have to worry about it. People who are eating anything that's in the forest have to worry about it. And also people who are concerned with the general health of the environment have to worry about it. It's not just a very thin ribbon of mercury cutting through your landscape. Now it's a pretty wide swath of mercury because these biological processes are moving it out into the floodplain and into the forest. Well, I can, tell you we, I can tell you that we were the first people to discover that because when that paper came out, some other scientists got in touch with me and said, you scooped us. Man, we are about to submit a paper on how P. 
PCBs, another horrible toxin that's in the water, gets out into the environment in spiders into the forest. So it's a great feeling to think, you know, that these students were involved in something that will actually lead to other studies and already has led to other studies.